It wasn't that I stopped talking. It's that I, I resolved that talking was too difficult. You see, in, in the move from Mississippi to Michigan, you would think it would be a jubilant journey for a young boy of, uh, I was then five years old, to going to the land of the, the promised land. You know, uh, For me, though, it was leaving the soil that I had touched with my bare feet. And I didn't know if I'd ever touch soil with my, with my bare feet again. And that was traumatic for me. I was leaving Huck Finn world. And, and forget social problems. I was leaving the, the earth of Mississippi, the, the clay soil of, along the banks of the Mississippi River. And that, that, that was a trauma for me. And I didn't realize that until I went back for a family reunion in my, when I was 40 years old. And I got back to the old homestead, and I felt it. Such a, a warm, not, not temperature, heat warmth, but such a, a psychic warmth hit me that I was back to that land again. And, and that, that, that journey, that, that choo-choo train journey from Mississippi to Michigan was, was a trauma. I mean, there are other little things that happened along the way uh, that, that one might pin uh, it to, the, the family, fam family things. I, I was an adopted child uh, of my grandparents, and, and I, I don't know how I can ever express my, my gratitude for that, because my parents would have been a mess, you know. And there were considerations about that. Where should I go? And that, that began to bother me when I hear those discussions at night. Where should James Earl go? But it was a journey itself that I, I, I really feel the, 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 the being ripped from the soil is, is what set me into a state of trauma. So by the time I got to Michigan, I was a stutterer. I couldn't talk. So my, 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 my first year of school, was uh, um, uh was my first mute year, <laughs> and then those mute years continued until I got to high school. And I suspect a lot of people are stutterers and 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 some somehow overcome it, or we, we all mask it. I'm I'm still a stutterer, but we all find a way to mask it. And sometimes I guess our vocabulary might be a little larger than it would have ordinarily been, because uh, we have to find a word we won't trip on. Uh, a word that begins with the right consonant. Uh, you know, I, 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 I resigned to it as, as a kid. I guess I was then about, you know, in, from 10 years old uh, when I was approaching um, serious school work, you know, like, you know, where really you, you had to really report what you knew. And uh, the teacher accepted that I could do all my reporting with a pencil. I didn't have to speak oral examinations, I did all my written. And I became a, a, just a nonverbal person. I became a, a, a writer, you know. And um, and I was resigned to that. that. That was okay. It was kind of quiet, you know. I, I compare myself now to Ali, Muhammad Ali, you know. Whenever I meet him, he doesn't say much. I think he enjoys it back there, not saying very much. Because he was such a, a mouther before, you know, and brilliant at it. Now I think he enjoys being quiet. Well, I enjoyed being quiet. I. It, it, it was, a, you know, as long as people respected and didn't bother me and didn't probe me, you know, I, it, it was a nice place to be. Donald Crouch in, in high school said, uh, do you like these words? And I was then writing words of my own. He said, do you like, do you like these words? Do you like the way they sound in your head? He says, well, they sound 10 times better when you give them out in the air. It's too bad you can't say these words. He began to challenge me to nudge me toward speaking again. And by using my own poetry and then other poets, because he himself was, was a compatriot of Robert Frost, you know. He, he himself was a poet. He himself said he, he learned a poem a day in case he w went blind. You know, he'd have a whole book of poems in his head. And he, he, he nudged me toward that, toward the, 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 you know, acknowledging and appreciating the beauty of words. It was a poem, the Ode to Grapefruit, uh, only because it, I had written it in the, in, in the meter. I, I, I had um, used uh, the meter of, of the Hiawatha. And uh, Donald Crouch used that as, as a reason to challenge me. He said, I don't think you, he said, this is a good poem. It's so good, I don't think you wrote it. To prove you wrote it, get up in front of the class and say it out loud. And that, that was the, t I, I don't know whether he, he, he concocted that challenge or not, but he, he really meant it. And I got up and I said it and didn't stutter. Nice surprise.
when I left the Army, when I left my, my training in Fort Benning, I bought a little um, used car that broke down in Akron, Ohio. In that little used car and, uh, was all my poems, you know. So I, I put it in storage, and when I went back to collect it later on after the Army, uh, uh, it was missing. And I, I'm grateful that the poem about grapefruit was missing, because uh, although it, it was, it was, it was um, had had all the poetic values and had all the the meter and all that, it was basically um, <clears throat> just as Longfellow uh, imitated the, off, the 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 fin the Finnish author of Kalevala, I, I imitated Longfellow's Hiawatha, <laughs> and uh, it had all that, but it was really about uh, uh, the. Beauty. I don't know if any, anybody anybody can, else can appreciate. I wouldn't expect them to. In the winter time, in, in in the snow country, citrus fruit was so rare. And if you got one, it was it was better than ambrosia. It was better than a peach. It was better than anything you could you could imagine from exotic worlds, you know. And I just poured my heart out <laughs> to, to, to the wonders of grapefruit. It was very simple, and I, I think blessedly simple. And when I look back on on, uh, on what might have put me on a, on this path or that path, I think the extent to which I have any balance at all, any mental balance, <laughs> is because of being a farm kid and being raised in those those isolated rural areas. Even in Mississippi, uh, there, there was no concern about uh, no immediate concern about uh, social problems. You know, we we, we were a, a feudal system of our own. Grandpa was a feudal lord, and we all did our work, you know. And there were 13 of us in the household. We, we, we were self-sufficient. My grandmother, though, began to prepare us in her own uh, neurotic and, I think, psychotic way uh, to face racism. So she taught us to be racist, which is something I had to undo later when I got to Michigan, you know. And in Michigan, it was even more isolated because it was, uh, you know, nine months of snow. <laughs> <clears throat> But uh, uh, it, it's as, as and as much as I I, I uh, f uh, yearned to flee that when I was a teenager, uh, and now I yearn to get back to that 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 simplicity. And my my son now appreciates that he's thirteen. He prefers to be in the country. I run counter to the uh, constitution, which uh, uh, which al allows for the pursuit of happiness. Well, happiness is kind of something giddy. Uh, and from my people, um, the concept of contentment was, was what the was what you were after, not to keep up with the Joneses, not to be driven. Uh, I mean, the idea of uh, lying under a palm tree and letting, letting a banana fall in your mouth, there's nothing wrong with that, uh, you know. <laughs> and if, if, a, if, if a wave came up too high, you rolled up, up the hill, you know. Uh, and I'm not saying the virtue of laziness, but the uh, virtue of being easy on yourself, the virtue of finding uh, an ambition that carried with it um, a lack of anxiety, you know. And, uh, and I think it's because we were self-sufficient as, 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 as a people, as, as a farm people, uh, even during the rationing period during World War II, we didn't have the anxiety that we'd starve because we grew our own potatoes, you know, and our own hogs and our own cows and stuff, you know. That that, that 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 put you at ease to a great extent. It, it made you it made you responsible. We children learn responsibility automatically. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was not we worked not because Grandpa said work. We worked because if we didn't work, the cow's milk would go bad, the chickens would starve, and stop producing eggs, and, and, and the pigs would would yell a lot. More and more, uh, when I single the person out who inspired me most, I, I go back to my grandfather. Uh, my grandmother had the most dramatic effect on my life because as a, she, she sent me in one direction and I had to go back the other direction for my sanity um, and for my ability to be a, a social human being. Uh, but the more I think about it, the quiet one, was the one that I think really influenced me because he taught me the value of being able to listen, being able to not to rush to judgment, 
being able to to be to be really rational, you know. Um, give an example: when we first moved to Michigan, we went to uh, uh, they, were, they were religious people, and uh, they lo they allowed me to decide for myself. But they were very religious people, uh, Protestants. And um, before my grandpa built his own church, we went to a, the neighboring town, and it was a, a white community, you know, up north, mostly. Uh, Middle European people and the Indians, Chippewa Indians. Uh, we were welcome to that church, but when once we got in, they didn't know what to do with us. They didn't know what to sing, for instance. So they sang, "Old Black Joe." <laughs> I mean, it, it's kind of a hymn-like song. I guess uh, Stephen Foster. Uh, and my grandmother was immediately incensed. My grandfather said, you know, maybe they don't know what to do with this. <laughs> maybe they didn't mean any harm at all. Consider that. You know? <laughs> so it was then when I began to say, well, maybe my grandmother isn't always right, and maybe I, I should not be a rabid racist as she you know, is, is recommending. Yeah, defensive racist, you know. And maybe I should take each person uh, um, as an individual. Reading was a big thing, yes, books were a big thing, uh, but the things that stick out were the newspapers. Every, every night after supper, uh, I guess before supper we'd hear Gabriel Heater, a famous news commentator. Uh, and after supper, though, we'd get the news from the paper, and my granddad would read everything that he thought was relative and pertinent to us, you know, to our lives. He'd read, read, it, read it out loud, you know. And uh, I guess I was influenced a great deal by that, you know, about uh, what was going on in the world. We were approaching World War II at that time, uh, and those those crises. And, um, and to the extent that the, the daily journals were able to give us information, uh, that, that was very important to us. Later on, I think that when I when I left high school, the the man who also affected my life, uh, Professor Donald Crouch, gave me a book of Emerson self-reliance and he said you know just read it when when you when you when you feel like you you, know, you have time and uh, it might be helpful well by then I had become a verbal person again um, and uh, it was important to go on to college uh, my uncle and I were the first my youngest uncle and I were the first members of our entire family to ever, ever go to college I was the first to ever ever go to the military so we, we were special. We were vanguards, you know. <laughs> and uh, and as, a, as a vanguard, it was important for me to pick uh, one of those big three, doctor, lawyer, engine, chief, you know, one or the other. Maybe teaching, but that, that, was, that was not, not, not really encouraged. You know. I, because I thought I liked science, and I did like the Jules Verne kind of science. In high school, I decided to, to uh, choose medicine. And that, that was my rationale for going to the University of Michigan on a scholarship. Um, it, it, it was, not, I, it was, it was not, my, not my favorite study, as I found out later. I was having great difficulty with, with physics and chemistry. So in my sophomore year, I took a senior anatomy class. And I thought anatomy being the thing that I should be most interested in. And if I could, if I could hack, as we called it, a senior class, I would continue. I didn't hack the senior class. So in my, in my junior year, I switched to the drama, drama department, also because, because I was in the ROTC. The Korean War was still raging, and I thought I'd be going to, if I didn't get into a med school, I'd be, I'd be off, off to war and probably dead the same fall. So I, I, I was determined to use my last two years in college doing something I thought I would enjoy, and which was, was acting. And it was probably because there were girls over in the, act, in the uh, drama school, too, you know. It's, it's always hard. It was always hard in those days, even at the university, at the uh, theater wing, to get enough boys to match the number of girls you had in those act, acting classes. Because boys thought, well, a little sissy, you know, a little sissiness going on over there. <laughs> because the drama school is too close to the music department and the dance department, you know. <laughs> one day, m my youngest uncle, the, the other uh, one who was the first to go to college, uh, Randy, 
and I were um, sitting out on the front porch, and he he was he was brilliant. He he ended up he just just retired from uh, Boeing aircraft in, in Wichita, Kansas, and he he knew he wanted to be an engineer, you know. Um, and uh, we would you know boys boasting, I couldn't top that, so I said, well, I'm going to be an actor on the stage, <laughs> and pop from behind. You know, my granddad had been listening behind the screen door. That was his way of discouraging that kind of thinking, you know. Uh, I was not only forbidden to see my father. I, uh, the idea uh, that you would uh, really take seriously a, a life of a, a troubadour. I mean, I was, my, my people were very, very simple. They were peasants, people, you know. So the idea of somebody making a living as an actor or a singer, you sang in church, you know, and you didn't act at all. You tried not to act, you know, you tried to tell the truth. The idea of, of being a troubadour on the road, uh, singing for your supper, was very uh, di disturbing to him. You know? So he, that, that was his way of dis discouraging that, that kind of thinking. No, but the, 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 his insane wife, my, my grandma, Maggie, hers changed because in her insanity, the idea, I mean, this is a woman who, who taught her bedtime stories were about lynchings and hurricanes and floods and rapes and murders, you know. Those are her bedtime stories. For me to go into a drama, that was, oh, that was kind of turned her on a little bit. She was the first one, I got a job over, uh, over at the county seat in Manistee, Michigan, the little, little uh, opera house. We had a summer theater there. And she was the first to be there, she was the first row. Want to see me in these dramas, you know? And uh, so she she opened the door uh, in terms of, the, uh, as far as the family was concerned, about you know allowing this to happen, you know. It wasn't acting. It, it was it was it was uh, language. It was speech. Uh, it was a thing that I'd been denied all those years, and then had denied myself all those years. I now had a great pre an, an, an abnormal appreciation <laughs> for, you know. And it was the, the idea that you can do a play like a Shakespeare play or uh, well, any well-written play, Arthur Miller, whatever, and say things you could never imagine saying, never imagine thinking in, in your own life. You can say these things, you know. That's what it's still about. Whether it's the movies or TV or what, that, that's what it's still about. When I was um, um, in, New, in New York, after I left the army, I studied for two, you know, two years at the American Theater Wing, studied acting, and which, meant, which involved dance and fencing and speech classes and, and uh, history of theater, all that. I was preparing myself for the theater. And, um, and I got a little job here and a job there, but it wasn't going well. And I considered sometime before uh, the mid-60s that maybe I should consider something else. And I went to NYU for uh, some vocational testing, for vocational guidance. And they found that I had a talent, perhaps, in architecture. So I applied to Pratt, you know, in Parsons uh, for that kind of training. And I was prepared to, you know, say bye-bye to acting, go on to something, something else. And before I went, joined my, my, my uh, fall classes, I got a job out in, in Indiana <laughs> that sent me back on the track of acting. But I, 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 I'm, I, I don't want to be, ever be a sentimentalist. I, I, I prefer to be a realist, you know. I, I'm not a romantic, uh, really. And uh, I, never, I never approached the, the show business from a sentimental point of view. I never saw it as a romantic and glamorous place. I knew real show business from my father's life. My father, who had been an actor since he, he left the world of boxing, he was a prize fighter when he first... And man, I, n I never really knew. Uh, man, I, I, uh, allegedly, I, I, went, I was faced face with him once in my, uh, when I was about th two, three days old, and didn't meet again until I was an adult. I was not allowed to meet him until I was an adult. So, but I knew of his career through his mother, and I knew it was not very successful. <clears throat> but I didn't know how good an actor he was. I found out later he was quite a, quite a uh, wonderful actor who excelled in the, in the element of simplicity. But um, because he was one black and then blacklisted because of his his involvement with labor unions and so on during those those years, um, he 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 just didn't get work, 
Certainly not in in areas that Red Channel's controlled, which was movies and t television. He got work occasionally in theater, you know. And he told me, when I finally met him, uh, he said, I've not been able to make a living at this, so I want you to know that's a possibility. That if you, you, you don't enter it for the money, you enter it because you love doing the work. And uh, so I, I had that, that reality uh, orientation. And I, I've never looked, looked, looked at it as a romantic place or as a place to make big bucks. Perhaps, perhaps I should have. I, I'd have been, I'd been richer if I had gone for the, <laughs> for the, with the bank, you know. Uh, but no, I, I, and also I've, I've applied that, that contentment um, uh, measure. Uh, uh, I was as, as content off Broadway as I was in, in, in a big Hollywood movie. And uh, I just try to be content wherever I am, you know. And it, it, it doesn't solve anything. It just, it, it just makes you able to move uh, from one, I think, um, I was told yesterday by some wonderful, brilliant mind that I met on a path out here. Churchill said, success is moving from one failure to the next with undiminished enthusiasm. Well, that, <laughs> uh, that, that's what I was able to do from my early. <laughs> and, uh, so not, nothing threw me, really. Nothing embittered me, which is important because I think ethnic people and, 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 and women in this society can end up being embittered because of the, the, uh, the lack of affirmative action, you know? uh, or, or the lack of, of removal of those, uh, those ceilings, those glass ceilings. Uh, and I, I never, that never happened to me, and I, I feel blessed. I, I'm a healthier person because of it. I can pass on a healthier state of mind to my son because of it. When I was finally allowed to see him, and I mean legally, I, 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 was, I was banned. I, I was not just, until I could decide for myself, uh, I, uh, there was such animosity between uh, th those two families. And uh, uh, it, it's still unresolved. It, it will never be resolved with my father. I, I had, had a meeting with him just a few days ago, and it's, it's, it's a mess. You know. But I accept that. He doesn't seem to accept it, you know. He wants to still sort it out. He wants to place our, he wants to place him and me and my son into some sort of galaxy. And I, I, that, that's, that's a sign of romanticism, and I, I, I don't care for it, you know. Uh, family relationships are, are, come from real, uh, real bonding, not, not from something imagined or, or a, a presumption about genetic you know, inheritance. You know. uh, it has to be real, and I, and I think the, a lot of problems we have a lot of the problems we have as a society is because we don't acknowledge that family is important and it has to be people who are present, you know. <clears throat> and, uh, and mothers and fathers both are not present enough with, with children. I'm, I'm not present enough with, with, with my son. You know, I'm, I'm here and he's there, you know. Often that's the case and, uh, and that's a problem, you know. And, uh, you don't build a bond without being present. It was as it should be. Uh, I, I, I was not, because of my father's or, orientation, I, I, I was not, I, I did not expect anything. Uh, no one asked me to be an actor, so no one owed me. There was no entitlement. Still is not. It is one of, one of, I think the arts in general, no one asked you. They might ask you to, be, to fly an airplane. They might ask you to, uh, to raise wheat, but they don't ask you to sing a song. That is still considered in this society uh, uh, one of those um, elitist or luxury uh, uh, in endeavors, you know. So the idea that uh, you are essential has not, has, has not occurred yet. I think with the, with the lack of appreciation for the National Endowment, it seems it may never occur in my time. Uh, but I think someday it, it must occur because it does occur in, in all great societies uh, of, all over Europe and uh, in England. Uh, the arts are, have always been an important ingredient to the health of a, a, of a nation. But we haven't gotten there yet. And, and so actors have to, have to accept that, that you know, we, um, no, no one asked us. So the idea of not getting work, that's, a, that's part of the territory.
I happened to land in a time in the, in the middle 60s that without knowing it and without being told by the theater, the, you know, the, the history of theater, which, which we now see from a historical point of view, was an explosive time. Uh, I got out of the army. Uh, in, in, my, in my world, I came to New York, for instance, and uh, uh, the civil rights movement was just beginning. And uh, that created a certain energy, a certain rumble, a certain impetus for, for black, black actors. <clears throat> and the, and, the, and the, the, the game was not to get caught up in it, not, not to get swept away by it, away by it, but to keep on, on, on track of what you wanted to do. Uh, you, you weren't going to the theater to, to change the world, you, uh, but you had, you had, you had an, a chance to affect the world, the thinking and the feelings of the world. Athel Fugard, one of the early playwrights that I, that I encountered in those days, uh, always said, he doesn't assume, and he, he was talking about South Africa then, apartheid South Africa, he never assumed that he could change anybody's mind, but he knew if he was good enough, he could change their feelings. And their feelings would affect their minds, you know, hopefully. And that, that, that's all we, we, we can expect in terms of missionary work, you know. Um, but I, I think it, it was more, it was more uh, uh, an, an, an unusual time than, than, and than any given person. And in that time, I did meet Ethel Fugard. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I met the whole avant-garde world. Uh, in, in England, it was referred to the, the angry young men period. Uh, in Europe, it was um, avant-garde. And we were a theater, theater of the absurd. Uh, put together, you saw... In, in, internationally, theater now being available to the proletarian, that anybody could be an actor. You didn't have to have the elite family background of the Barrymores. The, the door was open for Marlon Brando, you know, real common man. And when Marlon did his work, when he did his Stanley Kowalski, every truck driver in New York said, hey, I could do that. That's me, I could do that. And that was very important. It was a very, very important movement. The I can do that movement, you know. <laughs> And I was a part of that. You know. So it, that that included women could play men's roles, and blacks could play white roles, and, and truck drivers could play modern brand roles. And it was uh, I think that's that's what sort of opened life up for me, and opened that that artistic life up for me. I knew actors who, at at, at that time, were better than I was. Uh, one in particular who was so frightened by his own talent, he would only go to auditions drunk, self-destruction. And uh, I think uh, on the other end, there are actors who were not as good as I was, perhaps who, who could have hung in too, but began to blame everything on race, you know, I mean, if they're, if they're black or you know, whatever, uh, minority race. Uh, and I did none of these things. I, I, I sort of I say straight, you know, and square, very, very square. But always uh, able to walk straight line, you know, toward toward my 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 goal, toward it. Not the goal was not really important. The goal wasn't to be a millionaire or to be a Hollywood star. That was not the goal. The goal was something about uh, it was the goal was to find to find the goal. But I knew where it was. It had to do with getting on that stage and finding better and better uh, plays, and hopefully movie scripts to do. You know, to be a part of good storytelling. That that the goal was about that, you know, um, and no, no, nothing threw me off, uh, and neither poverty nor nor uh, uh, discouragement. Uh, um, nothing threw me off. It was, I really I didn't know Churchill's uh, theory then, but uh, I, I I lived it. Acting is not about anything. Romantic, not even fantasy. Even though you you do create fantasy, it's not about that. It's simply about something very very concrete. Um, a, a playwright conjures a, a a a vision of a world, and he interprets that world through words. You then take those words, on stage or on a screen, and try to bring it alive. Try to bring it alive by the inner interrelations between one character and another, and what they say to each other. In movies, it's less important what they say, it's how they behave. 
It's about that. So when a young man yesterday from Chapel Hill asked me, uh, you know, he said he was, he's determined to be the best actor in the world, where do I go? <laughs> oh, he, oh, he used the phrase dream. He said, I have a dream of being the best actor in the world. And I said, if you can tr turn that dream to imaging, you can image yourself, imagine yourself, and, and then achieving it, being able to plumb the depths of human feeling as much as Marlon Brando is able to. And then on the other end, a technique, um, fine clarity and uh, brilliance of language as much as Richard Burton did, then uh, you, you might be the best actor in the world. But it's, it, it's doing real things. It's not nothing, nothing about uh, fan fantasy. Oh, setbacks, yeah. I mean, there, there were specific ones, but they, again, uh, it, it, didn't, it didn't diminish my enthusiasm. Uh, being told one day that I had a job, my, my first job in a TV series, the next day to walk, go to a party and find a year, yeah, another act, act, young actor said, he has the job, you know. Well, somebody had lied to me, um, the producer had, you know. Uh, but that, 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 that was a game, you know. Then I learned that game could be even more vicious if, if you let it, you know, if, you, if you feel it that way, you know. Uh, deception and uh, uh, the idea that you're competing with, your, with fellow human beings can get rough. My wife knows actresses who, when, when they go to auditions, they will deliberately distract all the other actresses. They'll start telling stories. They'll start asking questions deliberately to throw you off. Uh, your balance. Well, I don't like to hear about stories like that. I and I, I certainly don't don't like to. Uh, my, my first first time on camera was with a, with a wonderful actress named uh, Diana Sands, and Diana began to try to tell me. My my first time on camera, she began to try to tell me, look, you know, if you if you want them to use your take, then you do something that distract the other actors' take. I said, you know, I don't think I want to know that. I don't think I want to be that busy manipulating because I came here to act, you know. And if I use all my energy manipulating, I'm not going to do my job. And there was something very disturbing about all that, you know. She was a brilliant actress and could do both, you know, could, could m manipulate as well as do, do her job. But, but I, I didn't think I could do that, you know. Oh, oh no! You don't. You don't have self doubt. You don't have fear of failure. If you do, you got to take care of it. You know. Uh, but if if you if your goal is if your if your if the way you you approach your goal is 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 right for you, then you won't have self doubt. You know. It, literally, uh, undiminished enthusiasm always stays with you. If if you, you're the only person who can tell what, whether you have talent or not. And there's a, a certain point where you got to be really honest with yourself and say, yeah, I do, and I'm going on, or, or no, I don't. And uh, your parents can't do it for you. Your critics can't do it for you. Once you determine that, then there should be no room for doubt. You know? there, should be, there is room that, well, maybe this isn't um, the right role for me. And that's always going on. You know? You're told no every day. You're not right for this role. And they might say, because you're too tall, they usually don't know why you're not right for it. It just you didn't you didn't ring a bell for them. That's all, and that's okay. You got to ex accept the fact that you don't ring a bell for everybody. Um, there's only one actor I know who does. Morgan Freeman, he he can ring a bell on the drama side, on the comedy side. He, he, you know, it's rare for this this young actor to miss uh, in terms of the way he achieves his work, and it's also rare for him to, to miss in his character. Uh, Whatever he does, it always seems to work in his character, you know. Well, that's very rare, and most of us don't don't have that going for us, you know. Uh, and we will we will fail to ring somebody's bell, and that's okay. Uh, when I first came into the theater, um, I followed Sidney Poitier's generation, which was not not far ahead of mine, a couple of years. But he had established the height, and for the rest of us, we were there to establish the breadth of what young black actors could do, you know. Well, uh, I figured there was room for all of us, for Luke Gossett, for Raymond St. Jacques, for G. Godfrey Cambridge, for uh, Billy Dee Williams. There was room for all of us, and there was. So we, we never felt competitive. 
And that was a blessing, I tell you. Well, I think usually there's the, the turning point that's very public and very acknowledged in you know, Newsweek magazine and whatever. And then there's, the, there's those turning points that nobody notices. And uh, at first, the blacks was one of those uh, quiet turning points. It became to be acknowledged later on as, as the production you know, went on year after year. But it included, I remember meeting with, um, with the producer. She said, James, I'm worried, except for Roscoe Lee Brown. I don't know whether I can gather a, a group of black actors who can handle, um, um, not classical language, but she handle language that doesn't have an ethnic, uh, you know, street twist or uh, rural, rural twist. She was not, not sure she could find actors who were, who were uh, trained vocally for that kind, you know, for speech. Um, and I said, I said you, you, she was included, you know, challenging me too. I, I said, well, you might not be able to. But um, you start with Lee, start with Roscoe, and I think you might, you might, you know. And she did. She she built a cast around Roscoe. Um, that could handle language. I remember Roscoe and I were referred to as fine mummers in one of the reviews. <laughs> there were these two fine mummers. Uh, uh, but she did gather a group of actors who can handle language. And that was kind of a phenomenon, that we weren't playing sharecroppers, that we weren't playing street dudes, you know. We were playing people of the world. Uh, uh, and the fact that it had some relevance to the, the movement at that time, the civil rights movement, and doing some acknowledging uh, the danger of racism. And Janae was very clever. He, he wasn't saying the whites were bad. He was saying, and the blacks were victims, he was saying any race who takes on a superior position is going to be threatened by the other race taking on it. And it could flip, flop, flip, flop, and we never get anywhere, you know. And uh, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was an important message. Is a play that's difficult to do now because uh, the that that play then tapped into the um, the um, sense of conscious uh, America's conscience, and I don't think that conscience exists uh, as healthily as it did then. It's a little bit too cynical for that play to work. That's a tough one because uh, the critic is there uh, as a as a an operative in, in, in that industry. Uh, he's supposed to have a job that helps make the industry work. He's supposed to inform people what's worth seeing, what's not worth seeing, according to his opinion. Or, he's a, or if, you, if you're Kenneth Tynan, he's supposed to tell you what you tried to do and how well you succeeded. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's very valuable. Uh, uh, but I, I learned early on, I think I was doing a play with uh, J.D. Uh, JD, uh, Cannon who was one of the uh, actors in the, the McLeod series, you know. Um, and J.D. said, uh, look, Jimmy, yeah, we're going to op open tomorrow night. Would you do me a favor? Don't tell me what the critics said. I can't handle it. I said, what? You can't handle it? He said, no. I said, oh, oh, what, if, if they're good, can I tell you? He said, no, I, especially when they're good. Because whatever they say is going to distort your ability to go on stage the next the next night and do the work you should do. If they say you were good, you're out there trying to trying to be good. You're out there trying to what did I do that was so good? And you're d distracted. If you, if you're bad, you're totally defeated. You, your your ego is deflated, and you're, you're, you're distracted. He says, I'd rather not know. And I decided at that moment that uh, I'd do the same thing. I, I'd not read them anymore. I let my my wife read them and my my agent read them. And if it was something I should I should know. They would interpolate for me, but I would not read that person's opinion. Uh, and 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 it reminded me of one of the one of the two books we were encouraged to read. It had nothing to do with show business. <clears throat> one was the Zen of Ar Archery, the art of uh, Zen and the art of archery. Rather other was uh, Rilke's uh, To a Poet, it's a series of essays and letters to a poet. And Rilke had said uh, to this young poet, yeah, I, "I sense what you're doing. You." You're writing for the critics. You're writing to hope to please the critics. He says, that'll never work because they're not pleasable. You can much write to please yourself. And then they might be pleased, you know, <laughs> but only that they're, they're secondary to what you do. Uh, 
and so th- th- this this all began to fa- fall into place for me, and um, and and I, I I respect what critics do, um, but I I don't the, the, their work is trails mine. I mean, I've I've done my work, and I must keep looking ahead, not not behind at, at some re- reflection. I have not been able to to, to, to laugh off the. Uh, Paul Robeson controversy. I, I write about it in my book a little bit. Uh, it's still painful, but at least what has happened, Avery Brooks now takes the same production, exact same words, and uh, presents it to the public. And it's a glorious production uh, and no controversy. I just I just happened to, to get in Paul, Paul Jr.'s way at the wrong time. Um, and he, he, he uh, concocted the social apparatus to bring the production down. Uh, he was behaving in a way that he, he had, you know, <laughs> the young playwright, uh, Philip Hayes Dean, said he's, he's acting like a McCarthyite himself now, you know. But, you know, you, uh, victims of, of tyranny learn from the bad guys. I mean, you see it in Israel, you see it in, in black people. I mean, if you learn from the bad guys, uh, you end up doing what they do. I really don't know. Because I didn't, I didn't, I sort of, I, I, I ambled into this, so therefore I, 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 I didn't record what works and what doesn't work, you know. So, um, and given that, I don't know if we, if we ever learn from history anyway, you know. Uh, you got to learn it for yourself. Given that, I think every actor has to find out what, what works for himself. And, and I, I'm hesitant to advise young actors because their world is so different from mine. From my, how you approach it, how you approach an audition is very different. Uh, I think they, they, they have to dress up more because we're, we're talking about imagery in movies more than we're talking about stage. I think you have to come on with an image. Be, you have to be an image. You, you have to dress the role much more than we ever thought of doing. We, we, we'd be embarrassed by that. You know, the idea that a blonde, uh, brunette woman with uh, dye hair, blonde just to, to, for an audition, probably not unheard of. In, in, in the, in the Hollywood situation, you know. And uh, the, the, uh, the business of training, uh, training is very difficult, uh, very different now. I think you have, to, you have to learn the basics. You have to learn something more than just acting. You have to learn uh, how to behave, how, how, to, how to fill your space on stage or in film. You learn the difference also, that this, the, the film space is, is an inner, inner space, but you got to fill it. You know, watch Paul Newman. He, and he is jam-packed, you know, <laughs> in a very small area of his face. It's all the energy that I would express in my whole body, he's expressing right here. <laughs> and that's a hard one to learn for a stage actor. Nothing. I don't know. Because it was not about achievement, you know. It's about sitting on, 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 on a path and going. Um, I would have been I would have been a good explorer. I would have been a, a good uh, you know with Lewis and Clark, because you're out there and there's nothing tell you, nothing telling you whether you're successful or not. There are no no landmarks. You know you're out there walking. You know there's a, there's a place you want to get to the co- northwest corner of the country, but. All you can do is walk, and there's space and space. It, it must have been a wild and weird, weird world, but I, I think I would, I would have fit in very well there. <laughs> I don't think I've done the role in film that I could say I leave that as my legacy. I've done it in stage, but I've not done it in film. I've not found that role yet, and I, 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 I like to find it. You know, it's, n- it's not too late. I, 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 I'm still learning the art of film acting. And um, once I learn it, I might find it and do it before I retire, you know. But uh, that, that's not something I, I, I need to do. That's something I, I'd like to do. I want to rebuild uh, a world similar to the one I came out of. Uh, we had the Mississippi River, and we had, <clears throat> in flood time, you could walk out in the, in the mud puddle, you see catfish. When the, when the flood subsided, the, Catfish lying in the puddles, you know. I, I want to rebuild a world that that is self-sufficient again. You know, 
I'm, I'm digging a, le a little lake now, three acre lake. I want to stock it with fish. And uh, I, w I want to rebuild that self sufficiency that I knew as a child. You know? And that's got nothing to do with show business. <laughs>
know, that I don't think people know that they want to get back out again yet. You know, I don't know if there's an American dream, uh, or, the, or that you'd call it an American dream. It's, it might be a human dream. I, I don't know. I don't know. I think there are problems we have to solve. If you want to call that our dream, you know, we're, we're, solutions are dreams, yeah. But, but um, dreams sound like fantasy. <laughs>